So imagine I'm sitting at a desk where I know the person across from me is invested in my failure. Frank was the manager I reported to in my first job out of college at Aetna Life and Casualty in Hartford, Connecticut. It was 1981. He let me know almost immediately that, and I quote, he couldn't understand how someone like me got the position when he didn't get a break in finance until he worked his way up. To Frank, a black woman in an industry primarily comprised of white men didn't deserve to be there. To him, someone like me was out of place and didn't belong. And yet at the time, Edna employed a group of amazing black professionals who understood the barriers that impeded the professional development of black talent, young black talent. I was brought into a family by my mentor, Alice Rollins and her husband, Dr. Cedric Rollins, who covered me and, and became like my second parents, my home away from home. I also found a great ally and mentor in Jean Baden, a brilliant Harvard grad who never got promoted past manager because of the racial barriers of the time. Jean and the others wanted to make sure that those barriers didn't limit me and other young black professionals. They helped me navigate my first evaluation from Frank, which would inevitably shape and influence my trajectory in the company. Their advice, number one, do your best work. Gather performance appraisals from everyone you work with. Use this feedback in your conversation with Frank to minimize his ability to sabotage and of course confirm that you are indeed out of place. With physical evidence of my hard work and an appended hint that others were aware of my negative experience with Frank, which would of course affect his own reputation, Frank gave me the outstanding review that I deserved and I was able to advance at Aetna. Now you might see this story as an important moment, standing up to Frank and his ignorance, but it wasn't just a moment. My mentors had created a movement by empowering me to advance in my career without the stigma of an unfair evaluation, by giving me the tools to arm myself against adversity. They understood that standing up to Frank was a short-sighted accomplishment. So we strategized around him towards a goal with lasting impact. I was poised to reach the highest limits of my potential, which laid the foundation for a 20 plus year career at Chase Manhattan Bank, where I became the first black female senior vice president in the bank's history. This I credit to my early mentors, being movement makers. Movement makers not only value the future, but they find meaning in the now. They look at the faces and voices around them today and recognize that there are individuals and communities, colleagues, neighbors, even strangers who are being overlooked, marginalized and hindered in their advancement. They know that these obstacles can be as obvious as Frank or as imperceptible as the structures and norms that normalize the subordinate position of people of color, women, and other historically marginalized groups. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, I was nurtured by movement makers. I learned the principles of movement making from my grandfather, Major Wesley Chapman. He created one of the first formal leadership programs for young black people in our community, the Older Boys and Girls Club. Years later at his funeral, 
Many of the original members recounted how his leadership changed their life trajectories, explaining how he was a movement maker for them. This example and model is one of many that shaped my outlook when I went off to Spelman College. Spelman is an HBCU, a historically black college or university exclusively for women. It was and remains an incubator of women in leadership and the power of mentorship. At Spelman, I found a movement maker in Dr. Jane Smith. In 1977, I was a college freshman and she was a vibrant young scholar with a PhD in education from Harvard and a Spelman graduate herself. She served as chief of staff to the then college president, Dr. Donald Stewart. Even though Jane was 12 years older than me, she was relatable and she showed humility and vulnerability, two critically important traits of movement makers. Like the time she joined the students in a sit-in at the president's house because she said it would be a defining moment in our college experience that would develop our courage and bravery. She personified movement making for me. Later in my career in 2003, I would take a year off from JP Morgan to establish the Spelman Center for Leadership and Civic Engagement, the only leadership center focused on women of color at a college or university in the United States. Empowering women of color to become leaders is critical because the systemic disparities we face are so stark. In 2018, for every dollar made by a white male, women made only 80 cents, but black women made only 61 cents. With this in mind, creating the Leadership Center was what I'd consider one of my first movements, figuring out strategies to lead others towards their own journey as leaders. Many of these ideas were informally shaped by the lessons that Jane exemplified. When I returned to JP Morgan in 2004, Jane would also have formal influence on the center as its first executive director. One of the first movement makers that I looked up to became a guardian of my first movement. Over the past year, we've seen a heightened attention being paid to racial injustice, making clear that need for movement makers in government, in business, and in sports. In one sport in particular, the potential for movement makers to spark culture change may be greater than in any other. I joined the National Hockey League in 2017 as its first ever executive vice president of social impact, growth, and legislative affairs. My mandate was simple, to set the league on a course, a new course to attract, retain, and develop fans with a specific focus on underrepresented audiences who haven't seen themselves reflected in what has long been considered a white man's sport. Every day, I get letters from diverse youth hockey players and their families who are proof that hockey reaches audiences beyond the stereotypes, but who have somehow been made to feel alienated in the sport they love. And every single day, I resolve to be a movement maker for them. What we do at the league goes beyond simply bringing the game to new communities. We are not chasing fleeting moments of getting hockey sticks in more children's hands. No, we are committed to a movement where the faces, the voices, and experiences of historically marginalized people are celebrated and normalized in the locker room, in the stands, and in the boardroom. If you truly make a movement, you'll start to notice the signs of change popping up in everyday context without fanfare, but with great effect. New norms will unmistakably be different than the norms you took for granted when you started. 
new opportunities will be made available to individuals and groups who couldn't see or access them before. You will literally feel the winds of change blowing. Someday it, it might be you on the other side of the desk where the person sitting across from you is at the beginning of their story, waiting for how you might react. But this time they feel empowered and not scared. Sometimes, of course, you won't find yourself sitting at a desk. You might not even be in an office. You might be sitting in an apartment waiting for a load of laundry to dry. When your child tells you they have something to say. A few years ago, I was visiting Jared, my second born and only son at his apartment in Washington, DC. When he looked at me and as he says, vomited the words up that he identifies as queer. He was sharing this aspect of his personhood with me and I was the first person in our family he told. Jared recently shared a letter with me about how he saw me in that moment. He wrote, she cried not because she was disappointed or upset, but because she worried that she at some point might have made me feel alienated or ashamed to share my truth. He further said, recognizing my hurt through her own made me feel seen and not hidden. It confirmed the trust that I laid in her by sharing that part of my life with her. I genuinely regard her as a superhero for raising an affirmed queer black child in America. To have your child write that about you, I not only get emotional every single time that I think about it, but I grow even more convinced in my belief in movement makers. Jared's story is an example of the profound importance of creating first a space and then a world where everyone can feel empowered, even in circumstances where you aren't imagining that someone you know could serve as your reason why. I believe that there is no single moment of my parenting that could have made Jared feel empowered in himself genuinely. It had to be a movement of love, sustained choices over time that validated his authenticity and sense of purpose and created opportunities for him to be his full authentic self. And that's the root of all movement making personally and professionally, sustained choices focused on uplifting and encouraging people to come out of the margins. It's what my dear friend, John Bryant calls love leadership, challenging and ultimately changing the status quo. I've yet to find anything more powerful and it's a power that every single one of us can tap into. If you want to be a movement maker, and create an equal future for all. Choose to lead with love because that is the only way.